Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. I want to thank our hosts for creating this session for us today and to thank each of you for sharing your time. My name is Tiffany Straza and I'm part of the team working on open science at the United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization or UNESCO. I thought it would be useful today to start with a reminder of what countries have agreed on in terms of supporting citizen science and to place that in a larger context of the global transformation of science, technology and innovation systems across regions and across disciplines to create a transition from science as usual to a science that is more open, more equitable and more transparent, um, a science that serves all of society, both practitioners and users within and beyond the conventional scientific community. We can think of the usefulness of such an approach when we consider global challenges and global goals, such as the Sustainable Development Goals. But at its heart, this goes back to the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which states that all people have a right to participate in science and to enjoy its benefits. We know that closed scientific practices amplify inequalities between people and among countries. Even though the majority of scientific research is paid for with public money from taxpayers, the practices and the results of that science are commonly closed off. Um, most of today's scientific knowledge is created inside institutions and it's published in outlets that require subscriptions or purchase to read. We know that science is produced and is paid for unevenly around the world. For example, the G20 countries still account for about nine tenths or 90% of research spending, of researchers, of publications and patents. Uh, you can find details about those statistics in the UNESCO Science Report. We know that the tools and the infrastructures that are used to create scientific knowledge are also unevenly distributed around the world. So change is, is needed and there has been a groundswell of action towards open science in many different contexts uh, in many ways around the world. But if we can come together with a shared understanding, we can create a more coordinated and therefore a faster and stronger effort towards that scientific transformation. And that's why UNESCO, which is the United Nations organization with a mandate for science, embarked on a, a consultation process. This was back in 2019 to help us develop that shared approach. And now two years ago, uh, 193 member states of UNESCO adopted this recommendation on open science, which is a global standard setting instrument on open science. For those who might be new to United Nations recommendations, a recommendation with a capital R is a legal instrument. It's not legally binding, but it is a negotiated text that sets out shared principles and norms. Countries commit to those norms and they also commit to a regular reporting process. In this case, every four years, countries are going to be checking in to show what they have done to make science more open. Um, we are developing a standardized survey and a way of assessing this progress, and you'll see member states uh, accept uh, or negotiate and accept that survey in 2024 to start off their the reporting in 2025. So with the adoption of this recommendation, we have these hundreds of countries who have committed to promoting and enabling policy environment for open science, to investing in infrastructure and building capacity, as well as making sure that our incentives are aligned uh, to foster open science. The recommendation is this international normative instrument. It has a standardized definition and shared values and guiding principles for open science. And importantly for us today, it addresses the fact that there are multiple actors and stakeholders of open science, including scientists as conventionally defined, but also many, many other players in this open science arena. I won't uh, go through the, the points each of these points on each of these slides, but I do want to reassure you that the slides will be shared and these materials are also available in multiple languages. I uh, would be happy to share those later on. But my point is today that we now have this shared definition and we have a, a, a framework that we can point to 
as we move towards science that is more open and more equitable for all. You've probably heard this idea that open science makes scientific knowledge accessible and available and reusable for everyone. But I want to stress that open science, as defined in the recommendation, also increases collaboration. It increases sharing of information for a broader benefit. And it opens up the processes of creating scientific knowledge and evaluating and communicating that to societal actors beyond the conventional scientific community. We see efforts across these key pillars of openness, one of which is open scientific knowledge, one is open infrastructures, which includes both digital and physical infrastructures and tools that we use to create science, but also open engagement of societal actors and open dialogue with other knowledge systems. In other words, we're talking about openness in knowledge production, as well as in knowledge dissemination, making sure that there's room for diverse voices to be heard when we are conceptualizing or designing scientific initiatives or specific projects, as well as when we apply the scientific knowledge that we create later on. So this transition to open science requires a shift in the culture of science, how we practice science is changing and how we value certain aspects of the scientific endeavor is perhaps more slowly changing. And therefore how we reward or incentivize certain practices must also change in order to reduce the tensions that individual researchers or scientists feel and to, for us to increase the sustainability of open science, but also the impact of open science in practice. There's also this need to shift from monitoring only scientific products or outputs, such as publications at the end of the scientific cycle, and move towards also assessing the values and impacts of science and in process and with a focus on the people who are doing that science, who are engaging with or who are benefiting from science. So how do we turn this vision into reality? Oops, pardon me. Um, member states are encouraged to prioritize these seven areas of action in their implementation of the recommendation. And this shapes our work within UNESCO and at country level. Again, I'm not going to read each of these out here, but I want to draw your attention to specific ones, which include developing enabling policy environments, creating a support structure for the different pieces of open science as defined for us to work together in a way that is is functional within the broader science technology and innovation system and which is supported so supported with infrastructure with training um, but is also supported with a culture of open science and with incentives that make sense for us to put open science into practice these seven areas of action reach beyond a single subset of science or a specific geographic region. And we see that as important because open science is not functional if only a few benefit. For open science to reach its full potential, it has to be global, it has to be equitable, it has to be uh, available to all. Or to put it another way, until it is open to all, and until we actually see a reduction in the existing inequalities in science, technology, and innovation systems, open science will have failed. But we recognize that not all countries and not all open science actors are starting on their open science journey from the same starting point. We know that context matters. Context affects how we prioritize open science and how we experience open science in practice. We know that lack of equity to, in access to skills or to tools is a barrier to participating in science in general, but it's also a barrier to participating in open science as it is currently practiced. In this meeting, we're focused, of course, on citizen science, and it is clear that the capacity to use or to create or to benefit from citizen science projects is not the same for all. I think it's also important for us to keep in mind that some open science practices have had unintended negative consequences and we need to pay attention when we're increasing the resource burdens on those who wish to participate or perhaps increasing the vulnerability of those who share their knowledge. So I think it's useful for us to ask when we're talking about open science, is it opened by whom? 
for whom is it open or to whom and and what is it open to for open by whom what i mean here is who decides what is shared or how it is shared and what people are permitted to do with the knowledge or material that is shared we know that there have been significant advances in the legal frameworks that support authors and creators to to choose and to make publicly known their choices about their works when they share but we still have work to do in terms of cultural change, as well as in terms of the governance of the systems and infrastructures used to share scientific knowledge. In terms of equity, we can ask ourselves some questions here about what it takes in order to open science to share data or knowledge. For example, if it is the responsibility of the individual researcher or citizen scientist to create open, open access to their knowledge, do they have the tools and infrastructure to do so? Do they have the skills and capacity? Do they have full confidence and security in their intellectual property rights? And do they face the same consequences as their peers in other countries or other contexts if they choose to create open access to their knowledge? When I consider open for whom and to whom, of course, the answer doesn't have to be for everyone in every case. Uh, the recommendation itself notes certain instances where uncontrolled open sharing of all data may be problematic, as in the case of, of sacred and secret Indigenous knowledge, or where sharing data may place a, a threatened species at greater risk. Of course, there are ways to share information about information and ways that we can open knowledge to those in greatest need. But I want to return to the point here that open does not automatically mean open to all. And we also need to remember that placed on the internet does not equate to fully open. We need to ask ourselves, who is the real audience for openly shared materials? Who is the intended audience and who is actually accessing them? Um, who has the internet or the time or the language or the capacity to access, to use and to reuse those materials? To guide our efforts here, we can think about the fair care and trust principles, as well as the broader concepts of genuine community engagement. And finally, open for what? Of course, this does not mean rights free or without rights. Rather, open sharing allows me to identify the creator and what they permit to be done with the knowledge that they are, are sharing. Um, the vision here is of effective reuse, but often the need in scientific systems is credit for contributions, um, both a moral need there as well as uh, a need based on, on careers. And there's also a need for resourcing, for continued action, even simple things like uh, continued storage and archiving of shared materials. We can also consider bad actors who use openly shared materials without credit or for purposes that run counter to the license statements. And we need to remember that our vulnerability to bad actors is not the same. Our capacity to identify or to act against misuse of our works is not the same. So in order for more people to adopt open science, we need to clearly understand what they have to lose and to help each other understand what we have to potentially gain. I would encourage us here to go beyond the moral argument and really examine the financial flows, the structures and practices in science today as we work towards open solutions that do truly serve all players. I do think that these challenges are not insurmountable. Open science is within our reach. And we see open science being enacted in many low resource contexts. The cultural change that we need is often as hard or harder to build than the financial investment required, particularly because um, we can often redirect existing spending on science to open science practices. And for us, looking globally, we do see that open science is growing, but it's growing unevenly across areas of open science, across disciplines and among countries. And the obstacles that remain are, are linked with existing inequities. So as we define our ways forward in open science, we need to consider who is involved in setting the norms and practices. I wanted to mention this very quickly. When we think about engagement with uh, with science or communication of knowledge, we often talk about um, three kinds or three levels of involvement. One is outreach, where we have an expert sharing knowledge, and that's different from coming together to create knowledge together. We can also consider co-management, where we decide together about what kinds of knowledge we might pursue or how we will do so. 
And I would argue that these same levels can be considered for the governance of open science or citizen science and in the context of this meeting, how we make decisions about citizen science systems. Are we sharing end results or are we involving more people in the decision making process? What does that look like in different contexts? And today I'm pleased to draw your attention to some new guidance that's been published with respect to expanding societal engagement in open science. At UNESCO, we have this open science toolkit, which is created in collaboration oops, sorry, with experts around the world. Um, and uh, often these are, are created as part of our thematic working groups, which have now over 700 members. I want to draw your attention to two pieces in the toolkit today. One is about policies and one is about societal engagement. For the societal engagement, um, this is, uh, in this case, this document is a summary and a way into a larger body of work that was led by the Community of Practice on Citizen Science and Open Science of the Citizen Science Global Partnership. That larger work is aimed at national governments uh, and it looks at how to open science to society via the use of open science policies. And at present, this document is now available. It's available in English, French, and Spanish with other languages to follow. I'll share a link a little bit later on, but you're also welcome to use the one on the slide here. Um, so this document explores this idea of, of introducing open engagement with societal actors in science, because this is a new topic for many. Um, the, the toolkit document provides examples, one of which is citizen, citizen science, and it helps us build a shared understanding, which helps people see how they can be involved and how they can support, um, as well as what the potential costs and benefits are. It's important to identify these costs and benefits, particularly for leaders at institutions or at the national level, um, people who are making decisions about where to direct resources and efforts. The bulk of the guide then focuses on, on how um, and the fact that we can use policies to promote open engagement. It, it identifies key building blocks of an enabling policy environment with attention to expanding understanding and building capacity at many different levels, as well as supporting the infrastructure and services that are needed for strengthening open engagement and considering the resourcing that open engagement actually requires. I'll also mention briefly here that the toolkit contains guidance on strengthening open science policies for a, a more general audience. And there we also draw attention to the ways in which policies can strengthen the uptake of open science practices that equip broader engagement. So what does all of this mean for action now? I would argue that part of the answer to how we will do this is we'll do this together. Collective and collaborative and coordinated action and investment are what we need to accelerate this transition to a truly global, equitable open science. And as we create that collaboration, it's, it's helpful to look back to the core values and principles as set out in the recommendation, because countries who negotiated this text have provided a framework, as well as provided the flexibility for us to enact open science in a variety of ways that suit specific disciplines and contexts, as open science, of course, continues to evolve. When we talk about expanding openness in science, we mean integration of these values and principles into research, into funding schemes, into science policy, as well as into national or institutional strategies. And I want to specifically note equity, fairness, and inclusiveness among these. It's been made clear that the kind of open science that we want is one in which there is equality of opportunities. So what's next and how can you participate? Within UNESCO, we have been working with countries and institutions around the world to come together to strengthen systems for open science um, in various contexts. And working with countries and experts around the world, we've identified five key challenges that are facing open science, one of which is, is uh, change in that conventional scientific culture. So at UNESCO, we have five open-ended working groups that are shaped around these major challenges to bring people together and to identify guidance and solutions that function in a variety of contexts. Um, and you can always reach out to us to join one of our working groups by registering for a meeting or by emailing us at openscience.unesco.org. And please, please do get in touch. I think from this community working on citizen science, we would really appreciate hearing your perspectives on how we should both assess 
and monitor the, the openness of citizen science, how we can identify contributions from citizen science efforts to the broader open science movement, and of course, how we can look at the impacts of this greater openness and engagement. So again, thank you very much for your time today. It would be a pleasure to, to stay in touch. Thank you so much.